Well, good morning. It's good to be with you all this morning. We have a, as was mentioned, I think in the announcements, we have a beautiful day outside that God has blessed us with that we can be together this morning and worship our God and sing praises uh, to His name. Appreciate the good job Brother Neil has done leading our singing this morning. Singing was very good, and I appreciate the songs that have been led this morning. Speaking of singing, kind of as an introduction to our lesson, I don't know if y'all picked up the. Um, the worksheet that's in the back or or in the, on the way coming in, but we're going to be taking a look um, at one of the songs that we sometimes sing uh, as as kind of the outline for our lesson this morning. Just by way of introduction, uh, a lot of y'all know I didn't grow up uh, in Athens. I've been here for you know about 13 years or so now, but I'm actually from Murfreesboro, Tennessee, so just about an hour and a half north of here. And I lived the majority of my childhood, or not, I lived all of my childhood and even some of my short adulthood uh, in Murfreesboro. And during that entire time, pretty much, my grandparents, who I'm very close to, uh, they lived down south in a little town called Vernon, Alabama. Do y'all know where Vernon, Alabama is? Probably not. Uh, if you know where Sulligent is, it's pretty close to that. Uh, it's close to uh, Columbus, Columbus, Mississippi. But yeah, very small town, uh, you know, kind of actually kind of reminds me of Ardmore, maybe a little bit, it's actually a little bit smaller, but it kind of reminds me of that. But we would visit my grandparents down south a good bit. That's one of my favorite things to do as a, a child was to go spend a week at my grandparents, sometimes two weeks, <laughs> if my, maybe if my parents didn't want me around or something. But uh, again, like I said, very small town, small town feel, very close knit. But along with that, the time that they spent there, they were a part of a congregation, uh, down in there. It's in Lamar County. I think the name of the church was the Lamar County Church of Christ. That church may still be in existence to this day. Uh, I'm not able to find it online, uh, but it was a very, I, I really enjoyed visiting with them at that church. Again, there's just something special about small congregations. You know, there's a stronger sense of family often when you go to a congregation like that. When I was a freshman in college, so y'all may not know how old I am, that would put it around 2004, 2005. Um, around that time, my grandfather, he, I'll call it retired. And I put, if you're not inside, I'm putting that in air quotes because uh, he still works for the same company uh, today in 2022, uh, just in a different role. But he's supposed to be retired. Well, when he retired, they made the decision to move from that small town, that small congregation to go back to uh, Tennessee, where we were, where we were living at the time. Uh, he spent over 20 years there in that little town. Well, I bring up that story, and you'll probably wonder where I'm going with that, but I bring up this story because I will never forget the gift that that congregation, or one of the many gifts that they gave my grandparents as they were leaving. They had taken a picture, gone out to the side of the church building, they had taken a picture of the entire congregation, and they had that picture frame. Well, along with that picture in that same frame, they had a copy of the hymn, The Blessed Be the Tie, that binds. It's a song in our song books. I think it's, I want to say, and we're going to sing this here in a little bit, but I think it's number 300 and, 302. We'll sing that after a little while. But they took a copy of that hymn and they put it in that picture of the congregation. And I want, every time I go and visit them, that gift, it just stands out because it's right there in the hallway. When you go in, you go a little bit to the right, it's right there in one of the main places of their house. It's obviously a gift that carries with it a great deal of special meaning because when you go through the words of this song and the sentiments that are expressed in it, it just, I don't know, made that gift very special. Christians, we have a tie that binds us together. And the words of this song, understand the words you know, that we sing, they're not necessarily inspired directly, but certainly they are inspired in the fact that they come from things that are taught in God's Word. From time to time on Sunday mornings, what I've done as I've taken one of the songs that we sometimes sing, and I want us to go through the words of those songs so that we understand what it is that we're singing, but also understand the great message that we are singing about. So I want us to consider this song specifically this morning. I want us to consider some of these scriptures that tie in, because there's a lot of scriptures that tie in with these thoughts. And I pray that as we go through this, that you'll be edified. I want us to consider this special fellowship that we have with our brethren. So kind of the background of this song, uh, this really good-looking guy right there, uh, his name is John Fawcett. Well, he's the, the writer of this hymn. He was from Yorkshire, England. 
I think it was back in the 1700s. I can't remember for sure. I think it was back in the 1700s, but from Yorkshire, England. Uh, it says that he was orphaned at the age of 12. Uh, I read different stories in different places, so I'm kind of putting some of these things together. Um, some things contradicted each other, but I'll do the best I can. It says that when he was a teenager, he became a Christian. He began working as an apprentice uh, for a tailor. But as he got older, he became more active in the Baptist church. He began preaching, doing kind of some fill-in work like I used to do for a period of time. But then at the age of 25, uh, after marrying his wife, he was invited to work full-time with a very small congregation. The church was so small, it says that they were not able to pay very much. Uh, one story that I read actually said that he received a lot of his pay in the form of uh, potatoes and, and produce. And uh, don't, get, don't get any ideas uh, this morning. Um, I thought that was interesting though. That started to become more of an issue though because as the family, as they were married for a while, uh, his wife was expecting their first child. And uh, John, he reached out to a much larger congregation in London and he was invited to come to work for that very large church in London. Great blessings, much larger salary, much more adequate for a growing family. So his family made the, the decision to, to leave that small congregation. They packed up and they were ready to leave and they were going to the big church. One account that I read suggested that that small church was so sad to see them go that they begged them to stay. Another story said that John's wife Mary, as they were getting ready to leave, that she just said she could not leave the people that they loved so much. And John shared that sentiment. They unpacked their wagon. They left. Or they let the church in London know that they would not be coming. And they stayed with that congregation for the rest of their lives. It says in one story it was another 54 years. Well, this song apparently was, was penned with that backstory in, in mind. I thought that was a pretty interesting story to think about as you think about the words that we're going to see here this morning. So now let's get to the first verse. Let's see how, how this song starts. But this entire song is just so meaningful as you go through it. He starts out in the first verse. He says, Blessed be the tie that binds our hearts in Christian love. Within the church, we, you know, even with this, within this congregation, you know, there are a variety of earthly connections between us. You know, some of us are, are physical families. Uh, you know, I'm here with my wife and my child. That's a connection that we have. Uh, maybe you're here with some of your friends that are friends outside of this church. But this tie that this song talks about, it's something that's far greater than those earthly ties that I just mentioned. And the reason I say that is because earthly relationships, well, they can be broken. For example, maybe sometimes we're separated from one another. We're put at a distance from one another. So there's that uh, break in that relationship, if you will. Uh, even ultimately at one point, you know, we're all going to be separated because of death. That doesn't mean that we don't love our families, that we don't love those that we are friends with here on earth. But we've got to understand while these bonds are special, they're not eternal. The tie that binds us says that binds our hearts together through Christian love. And there are so many passages that we could go to regarding this, but I thought of four, and I'll go through these pretty quickly. For example, in Colossians chapter 3, one thing that Paul says in verse 14 is that we are to put on love. Well, why is that? Well, because Paul says it binds everything together in perfect harmony. First John chapter 4, John says that this love, well, it's from God. And it talks about in that passage about how knowledge of Him, it should cause us to love one another. Well, why? Because He loved us by sending His Son. It talks about in 1 John chapter 3 and verse 16 that our love it should be patterned after the love that Christ showed us by laying down His life for us. And in John chapter 13, something that we ought not ever forget, Christ said that people will know who His disciples are. How? By the things that they do in worship, yeah, I know that that's a very important thing. By the fact that they don't have instruments in their worship, for example, is that how? No, that's not what he says. He says that we will, they will know who his disciples are because of the love that they have for one another. The tie that binds us that this song talks about is very special. It's so different from the world. Why? Well, because it's patterned after God. He goes on in the end of that first verse to say the fellowship of kindred minds is like to that above. Again, we have a tie that binds us and it is made strong by the unity that we have. 
Uh, he actually mentions unity again, alludes to it there in the second verse, but for this verse, he specifically mentions, he's focusing on the idea that our unity, well, it ought to be patterned after the unity that exists between the Father and the Son. For example, in John chapter 17, Jesus specifically prayed He wanted His people, talking about us, He wanted us to be united. Specifically, He prayed that those who would believe in Him would be one just as He and the Father are one. So that's our pattern. Also in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, we talking there at the very beginning of that book, that book that talks about all the different problems that existed with that church. Paul strongly warned at the very beginning of that epistle against divisions. He viewed unity as absolutely vital. And he specifically says in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 10, he says, I appeal to you, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind and the same judgment. Our tie, as we sing, this tie that binds us, it is dependent on us being like-minded and unified, just as God is. He goes on in the second verse. Again, I know I'm going through this fairly quickly this morning, but he, he starts out in the second verse. He says, Before our Father's throne... We pour our ardent prayers. We kind of already talked about this this morning in our announcements and also before that, and also in addition to that. A common privilege that we have as Christians is we have the ability to approach the Father's throne in prayer and we have Christ as our mediator. The thing is, as we think about our relationship with one another, this tie that binds us together, part of the benefit of this privilege is that we can use it in our relationship to one another. For example, in James chapter 5, it talks about how we are to pray for one another. We pray for one another during times of trial. Why? Well, because prayer is very powerful. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. We also see in the book of Acts, as you think about the early Christians, the example that they set for us, what do we find them often doing? The early Christians were often found praying. In Acts chapter 2 and verse 42, it explains that the early disciples there at the beginning of the church, they were devoted to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and what else? Prayer. Often you go through the book of Acts, if there was a big moment of trial, maybe if someone was in prison or, or something big was happening to one of the brethren, what could Christians be found doing? They could often be found praying together. Prayer is absolutely a benefit of this common tie that we share. Praying with one another. Praying for one another. And that strengthens our relationship with one another. Going back to the topic of unity, he concludes the second verse here. He says, Our fears, our hopes, our aims are one, our comforts and our cares. Again, that statement there is very heavily rooted in that unity that we talked about just a little bit ago. For example, in 1 Peter chapter 1, it talks about how we share spiritual goals. We share mindsets that only Christians are able to understand. It talks about in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 and 4, that we share in a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. It talks about an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. That's something that we share. It talks about in 1 Peter chapter 5 that we also share and the temptations to sin by the devil who is out to get us. Be sober-minded. Be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Resist him. Firm in your faith. Pay attention. Know it that the same kind of sufferings are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. You know, sometimes, thinking about that verse, sometimes we come to the conclusion that we're the only ones that struggle. We come to the conclusion that we're by ourselves. I want you to understand that that feeling, that doesn't come from God. That's Satan. He wants to convince you that you're alone. Peter says quite the opposite. You're not alone. Know that what you're going through, it's been experienced by others in the brotherhood. Even Christ understands what that's like because He experienced the same thing. You are not alone also talks about in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 33 that we share the common goal to seek first 
the kingdom of God. Again, that's something that only Christians can understand. Sometimes people look at the way we live our lives, the way we prioritize you know, spiritual things. Sometimes the world will not, the world never understands that. But your brethren understand what that's like. To seek first the kingdom of God. We encourage one another to do that. As Christians, we share in so many areas spiritually. And as we think about what we share with one another, you know, the, the Lord's Supper, as we're about to take this morning, it is a reminder. We do that together because it helps us remember, again, we're not in this alone. This is something that we share together. This strengthens our time. We can understand each other better than any non Christians can understand us. And we've got to remember that because we can be a help to one another if we'll remember that. Going into the third verse, he starts out, he says, We share our mutual woes. Our mutual burdens bear. Galatians chapter 6, the first couple of verses, really that, that passage in its entirety talks about how Christians are called to bear one another's burdens. He says, Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. As we've already talked about, we pray, for example, we talked about prayer in the last verse. We pray for one another during times of spiritual weakness. We look out, we help each other bear those burdens that he's talking about there in Galatians chapter 6. But not just in a spiritual way. We also see countless examples, not countless, but we see several examples in the book of Acts. Not only did Christians aid one another spiritually, we also see that Christians aid one another during times of physical need. In Acts chapter 2, we see the example, Christians don't just help each other during times of spiritual need. Again, they were seeing to those physical needs in the sense that they went as far sometimes as to sell their own possessions. Why? Well, because their brethren were in need. In Acts chapter 11, you go forward, we see that there was to be a famine. The brethren, it seems like in that passage, you look at them considering that need it almost seems like without hesitation, they saw the need, they decided to send aid to those brethren in Judea. So we consider their example this morning. Do we have that same bond with our brethren? Would we be willing to do those things that they did there in the book of Acts to help our brethren? We need to. He closes the third verse. He says, And often for each other flows the sympathizing tear." Turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. I'm going to read a longer passage here. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, going along with the last part of that verse, we see that the church is designed for us to care for one another. Starting at the end of verse 24, Paul says, he says, but God has so composed the body, giving greater honor to the part that lacked it, that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. Our bond in the church, it is so tight that if something happens to one of us, it affects all of us. Going along with that, Paul also said in Romans chapter 12 and verse 15, rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who who weep. I think we could sum up this verse to say that because of the love, because of the unity that we have with one another, we ought to care about one another. We ought to care about one another's struggles. And any time one of our brethren needs help, we need to try and help them. Final verse this morning. He closes the, or he starts out the last verse. He says, When we asunder part, it gives us inward pain. Going back to that story I started you with that my grandparents when they were leaving that small congregation in Vernon, Alabama. Understand, it was very tough for them to leave those people behind because they had developed great relationships with those people. You know, they left behind people that they really cared about, people that also really cared about them. Because of that strong tie that we have with our brethren, it ought to break our hearts when we leave one another. We should miss one another when we're not together. Think of the example in Acts chapter 20. Acts chapter 20, we see the example that Christians were sorrowful when they were departing one another. An example of this, as I mentioned in Acts chapter 20, is the example of the Ephesian elders and Paul. 
They were all together, but they were about to depart one another. And it talks about in that passage, starting at verse 36, it says, And when he had said these things, he knelt down and prayed with them all. And there was much weeping on the part of all. They embraced Paul and kissed him, being sorrowful most of all because of the word he had spoken, that they would not see his face again. And they accompanied him to the ship. Those brethren in that passage, they knew that they were not going to see Paul ever again. And there was weeping as the result of that. See that question? Do we have the same feeling towards our brethren? I would say this morning, if we don't have those same feelings for our brethren, we need to examine ourselves and ask ourselves why. I think part of the issue is, is that the modern day problem that we have is that we are all so busy. We've so, all got so much to do in our lives outside of these walls. We don't know each other like we ought to. We're not spending time together getting to know one another. You know, it's really easy to assemble together. It's really easy, though, to part without any emotion connected to it when we're a bunch of strangers. But if you examine yourself, you might realize part of the issue may be your heart. Are you making an effort to get to know your brother? Are you spending time with your brother? Or, when the amen is said here in just a few minutes, do you run out the door and never talk to one of your brethren? If that's the question this morning, you need to change that. We need to take interest in one another. And when we don't, we ought not be surprised when those feelings are not shared mutually by our brethren. He closes the, the song. He says, but we shall still, and this is a perfect ending of this song, we shall still be joined in heart and hope to meet again. Turn in your Bibles to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Of course, there is going to come a time. Maybe there's going to come times where we're separated due to all different kinds of physical reasons, due to a distance, maybe sickness. But ultimately, we're all going to be separated eventually due to death. But as we have discussed already, our tie is not the same thing as family. It's not the same thing as our friends. Our tie is not an earthly tie that can be broken. We all share in the hope of heaven and an understanding that our earthly ties, while they are special and they are good, we understand that those things are temporary. Christians, we have a hope to eternally be together with the Lord. He says, starting in verse 13, he says, but we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. That's talking about the world. Verse 14, for since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. For this we declare to you by a word from the Lord that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord Himself will descend from heaven with the cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first, then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. That ought to be an encouragement to us. While we may at times be separated physically, we all wait for the day that Paul was talking about when the Lord will return so that we can all be together forever with the Lord. I love spending time with my brother here on this earth. I enjoy the relationships that we have with one another. But brethren, I look forward to spending eternity with my brother in heaven. Why? Well, that's because that's where God is. It is our hope of heaven which keeps us tied together. Before we conclude our lesson this morning, I think it would be very appropriate for us to sing this song. If you'll join me, the song is number 302. Number 302. We'll sing this song and then I'll have some words of conclusion here in just a second. 302. Blessed be the time. <clears throat> Blessed be the tie that binds our hearts in Christian love, the fellowship of kindred.
mind is mighty that above before our fathers from before our heart and prayers our fears are hopes our aims are one our comforts and our cares we share our mutual woes our mutual burdens and often for each other blows the sympathizing tears when we are under part it gives us inward pain but we shall still be joined in heart and go to be again. Thank you so much for, for joining me in that song. You know, every you know, I've gone through different songs since I've been here, and everyone has their favorite hymns. Um, and I, you know we all have individual ones that are favorites to us, but hopefully after studying the words of this song and singing that this morning, hopefully this is a song, even if it may not be one of your favorites, hopefully it's one that as we sing it in the future, we will find great comfort in this song. The sentiments as we've seen this morning that are expressed in this song, they should reflect the attitude that we have towards our brethren. And as we said, if it's not, we need to make a change. Certainly we have great blessings in Christ and how great it is that we get to share those blessings with our brethren. As we close here this morning, is there someone here that is not yet a Christian? We've been talking about this tie that binds Christians together and it is a special bond that we have. But understand if you're here and you're not a Christian, it is only a tie that, has been, that is shared by those that have been added to the church. Those that are added to the church are those that have been saved by grace and by faith in Christ. Those that have been obedient to His will. Peter commanded in Acts chapter 2 and verse 38, he says that everyone needed to repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins. And in Acts chapter 2 and verse 47, it says the Lord added those people, those that were saved, to the church. If you're here this morning and you're not a Christian, I would ask you why not. Maybe you're here this morning and you have questions about how to go about doing that. We would love to talk with you about that. If you're here this morning, your life is not right. Let me encourage you. Turn your life over to Christ so that you can share the same blessings that Christians have in Christ. We're about to sing a song of invitation to encourage you to consider these things, consider your life. Let me encourage you. Examine your life and consider these things as we stand and as we sing.